Hi everybody and welcome to this webinar from the uh, Mental Health Professional Network. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, seas and waterways across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and um, pro uh, sorry, participants are located. We wish to pay our respects to the elders past, present and future uh, and for the memories, the traditions, the culture and the hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. So the acknowledgement of country is always important, but certainly tonight with our topic being about whether we are ready as practitioners to make our services available to clients, patients who are Indigenous Australians. So I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight. We've currently got 638 people and rising uh, logged into the webinar. Um, and also to people who watch the podcast uh, or the podcast later on. So welcome everybody. Now I'm Steve Trumbull. Um, my role here at the University of Melbourne where I am at the moment is as Head of Medical Education. I'm a GP by training. Uh, the only clinical work I do these days is to go out for a couple of months each year to remote communities in the Northern Territory as a GP. Uh, but my main work here is at the University. We've got a really good panel tonight to help us through uh, the discussion. It's going to be a little bit of an atypical webinar in that we're not going to follow the slides and to have a sort of uh, slide-driven presentation. We're going to learn by discussion and conversation tonight and also by responding to the questions that you ask through the, uh, the question part on the, um, uh, the webinar app. So we'll come to that in just a moment. Before we do that though, and because we don't want to waste time uh, going through everybody's bios in great detail because it's a fascinating group of people, um, I would like to introduce though uh, our first panelist who's uh, Dr. Louis Peachy, who many people will know. Louis is a uh, rural generalist from Atherton in Queensland. Welcome, Louis. G'day. Good, we've got you there, that's great. Now, we're going to jump straight in the, the deep end of this, Lewis. There was some criticism of the webinar on Twitter during the week, which you responded to. Some people felt that the title that we'd chosen was maybe um, inappropriate. Do you have what it takes to engage with Indigenous people? What are your thoughts on that? See, I must admit, I, I do find it interesting that um, uh, people would get upset about a title without actually knowing what the content is. But you know, Lord love them. That's okay. Um, uh, I, I think the the I mean part of part of the, the title was um, somewhere between ironic and facetious, um, but that was nevertheless based on the experience that a number of us have had working with um, uh, with non-indigenous um, health professionals who are who end up being very very concerned about their ability to engage uh, indigenous um, uh, patients. Um, uh, and so we, we asked the question a little facetiously, in a sense. Um, uh, and you know, and the short answer to it all is, is well, if you're capable of some thought and, uh, and empathy, then you're probably qualified. Um, uh, but, it, but it was just, it was basically calling out the elephant in the room as to how much people tend to be frightened about the topic matter. Um, and, and certainly my experience in talking to non-Indigenous health professionals is when it comes to mental health, um, there tends to be just just an extra layer of concern um, about dealing with um, with indigenous patients. Um, um, and you know, so I, yeah, I think Great. it's unusual so, place to cover people. Absolutely. So the elephant's front and centre, which is the best way to deal with an elephant. So we will examine it closely during the course of the uh, the webinar. Our next uh, panellist is Dr Jeff Nelson, who's also from Queensland, a psychologist uh, by training. So Jeff, welcome from Cairns. Anything you'd like to add to what Lewis has said? Um, just quickly, I mean, I, I quite welcome the, uh, the comments on Twitter, even though I'm not a Twitter person. Um, but also too, there's that sort of whole conflict between or sort of difference in views about is this about being culturally competent per se or being professionally efficient with Indigenous mental health clients. And I think those two things are worth talking about as, you know, is one, is A necessary for B and can you have B without A? So look, the more commentary, the more people talk about it, even though it may seem negative, let's run with it, I figure. Okay. 
Great. Well, thanks for that. So um, we'll now meet the third uh, member of our panel, who's um, Dr. Mary Emilias. Now, Mary, you're also in Queensland. You're on the Gold Coast. Uh, Lewis and Jeff are both Murray men. You're a non-Indigenous health practitioner. Um, from your perspective, what are your thoughts about what Lewis and Jeff have already said? Yeah, look, I, I don't, I don't really have much to add. I, I, I don't like upsetting people, and um, you know, I suppose I, I felt I found the title a bit odd as well, to be honest. But then I just, and I felt a little bit nervous about the webinar, which I don't usually do. Maybe because I'm on a panel tonight rather than facilitating. Um, but I, then I thought, you know, I'm actually, I feel really safe with Jeff and Lewis, and um, so I don't really have anything to add on this one. I'll contribute more later. Absolutely, and I think you've identified that the facilitator's got the easy job in this. It's the panellists who do all the heavy lifting, but also the audience. We definitely want to hear uh, questions from people involved. Those of you who have been to MHPN webinars before will notice that the uh, platform's changed, um, the webcast platform, and most of the navigation buttons you're going to need are located at the top right of your screen. Um, so uh, please have a look up there. You'll see that to use the chat box, and there are a few people using the chat box at the moment, um, there's the purple button there. If you've got questions, so use the blue hand button to enter your questions. Um, I don't think we have any questions yet, except Leslie can't hear anything, so hopefully we'll get more questions as we go. Um, and also the slides and resources, and Mary has discovered some more resources that we'll put up towards the end of the webinar. Uh, you can get those through the light blue download button that's there. There's also a help button if you need assistance and read back of the conference providers. Uh, you can message them directly or ring um, the number that's there uh, if you need to get in touch about any problems. So we'll get into the meat of the webinar now and you've had the case circulated again. We won't read through the case in detail. It's a little bit different again in that we are not looking so much at the needs of a client or a patient. We're looking at maybe the needs of the practitioner through this, uh, through this case study. So Sophie is a 27-year-old general practice registrar and you've seen that she's met with um, a patient, Jason, who she's seen a couple of times. Um, she's now going to talk to her uh, GP supervisor who is a very wise and slightly um, uh, professionally advanced uh, rural generalist GP. I don't know, Lewis, does that sound familiar to you and do you, have you met Sophie's in your career? Um, yes, yes, I have actually met a number of Sophies in my career. Um, and what, um, would you, um, what, what would you say to Sophie in this situation? Um, I think I'd first say, well, I think you've done a good job, Kit. Um, and, um, uh, and the fact that this, this young chap um, you've managed to engage him and he's coming back to see you um, is already a very good start. Um, uh, I, I think typically my, my experience has, has been that the um, these, these um, lovely young folk will um, wonder about um, uh, whether or not there's, there's particular um, cultural or social niceties. Um, well, they'll be worried about making various faux pas. Um, uh, they'll, be, um, they'll be worried as to whether or not there's something substantively different um, in dealing with mental health than Indigenous um, uh, patients or clients. Um, and, and I suppose, that, you know, in, in the... The, the end result in mental health is really the same across, I think, the entire species. I think the, the substantive difference that you're going to get um, uh, in particular cultural groups, particularly in Indigenous groups, is it might be the specific stressors that people are, are unfamiliar with. So how somebody responds to stress, how that might affect them, um, you know, spiritually, mentally, physiologically, I think that's all pretty much the same throughout the species. But the thing, the thing that uh, might be the, the top 10 stressors on your list um, could be very different. Uh, on my days with Headspace, it was a, a, an issue, uh, one of the issues that we we're having with the, a bit of software, um, was, um, it was, which was programmed beautifully um, um, for a lot of, of essentially urban-based uh, non-Indigenous kids. And they, they looked at the main stressors, and the main stressors that the, the, a lot of the uh, urban-based middle-class kids uh, were having 
would probably may have not made the, the top 50, maybe not the top 100 of uh, a lot of the Aboriginal young people that were, that were coming along the headspace. But how people respond to the stress, um, how it affects them, well, that's pretty much the same. Um, and, and in terms of, of having that therapeutic relationship, again, it's all pretty much the same. There isn't, there isn't a great deal of difference, um, um, really, once you've established that, that bit of a rapport. There may be some, some, some tiny little things. You, you, may, uh, you, you may not go out of your way sticking your eyeballs in front of the other person's eyeballs, but I think that's to be true, really, of, um, of, of anybody who's feeling a bit sad or distressed as you try not to be overly confronted. Um, sure. uh, so you know, it, it's, it, I think I think the first thing is hey, you look, you've done a good job, and and don't don't be worried about this, and this will unfold very naturally, um, uh, and and ultimately you're going to be culturally different from any patient who walks through your door. It's just some patients that's going to be a small cultural step, and others that's going to be a, a slightly larger chasm. Great. Well, thanks, Lewis. I think you've actually already hit on one of our first learning objectives, which is uh, that what we want to do is look at identity, uh, particularly through the webinar, but through that discuss on um, how a focus on the commonalities and shared experiences we have can help in therapeutic work and how to go about achieving that. But we do want to look at what challenges, tips and strategies there may be in, for working with Indigenous clients, including collaborative practice uh, in the context of Australia's social, scientific and political environment, so a very important one there. And finally, we want to uh, finish out the webinar by talking about how practice and discourse around boundaries can impact our work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander clients across different professional disciplines. So plenty for us to cover tonight, and Lewis has got us um, very well opened up with thinking about about uh, what we have in common and to basically reassure Sophie in this case that uh, yeah, the fact that um, the patients come back to see her uh, is a really good indication straight up that she must have done something right. So that's really important. So hopefully Sophie's feeling a little bit better about herself. I'm not sure though, Mary, um, you actually wrote this case. Tell us a little bit about Sophie and what she's going through at the moment. Yeah, look, it is pretty much based on my early career in North Queensland so um, you know I I guess I had had a pretty good education at university about you know um, the gap between Indigenous health and um, non-Indigenous non health and um, I guess I probably had some very idealistic views that I could go and make a difference. In actual fact I did six months working in an Aboriginal medical service as a, a GP registrar and I actually found it really difficult. I found it really chaotic and I learned all these things about my own obsessional personality that it wasn't a really good environment for me. Interestingly, it's now my favorite environment and I love it much more than Gold Coast University Hospital. So I don't, I, I'm, you know, 20 years older, but I've also had the experience of actually getting to know lots of indigenous people and people like Jeff and Lewis and Mark Wenatonga, colleagues of mine. But I think as an early practitioner, um, I, I, would, I did kind of worry that I didn't really know what I was doing. That's true about everything. You feel like an imposter when you first start in any career, but especially um, working with, with uh, Aboriginal people for the first time, I just I felt like there was probably um, all this stuff I just didn't know. And to be honest, there, there are definitely still situations where um, I don't... I know there's lots of things I don't know. So maybe part of it is the fact that I'm more comfortable now with not knowing. Um, so what do you do when you don't know? How do you resolve that discomfort? Uh, I don't, I, I will, I'm probably more comfortable with, with saying to the, the person that I'm working with, look, I don't really know much about this or what, you know, even a kid that tells me about the video game they play I'll ask them to explain it to me, or hmm. I might say, you know, I've just spent, a, I've just recently come from a job working all over Cape York, and I very much don't know about the dynamics or the politics in in the communities. I do think it's really important to try and learn as much as you can if you are going to a particular place. So I think what Sophie did really well was be respectful and patient, and you know, it's it's humanistic 
Rogerian attunement, unconditional positive regard, empathy, and she communicated that effectively enough for the patient to feel comfortable. I do think it is important to have a knowledge of the history of um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia, and I think that's a lot easier to access now than it was when I was at uni. You can watch Blue Water Kingdom or lots of different stuff. Um, and I think when you're going to a particular community, it's really helpful to find out about that local place. And the other thing I've found really helpful is, is understanding the value of having cultural mentors. So, you know, there's Indigenous health workers in most places that, that any of us will be working and they're, they're just invaluable because they're part of the community and they can help you figure out that stuff where you, you know, the relationships between people and the history and it's very, very helpful. So obviously recruiting help from people like Aboriginal health workers is really important. What about other health professionals? I'm just wondering about psychologists and this I guess brings us in with Jeff who's a psychologist. Uh, it would be feasible I guess that Sophie, the, the um, doctor in this case, would refer to a psychologist. Uh, what would be your first up approach, Jeff, if you were to receive a patient or a client like um, Jason, how would you approach his care? Um, in the context of Sophie, or if I had Jason as a, <coughs> a client, well, I guess I guess if we think that Sophie's made a diagnosis of depression and realising that in fact some um, uh, counselling or some psych psychological intervention is going to be the best way to go, she might uh, refer to you for that. How would you go about establishing your therapeutic relationship with um, uh, with with Jason? And are you actually qualified to treat Jason? Look, I'd, I'd like to think that I am qualified to treat Jason. Um, that was a provocative question, just to get things going, Jeff. Yeah, but look, if, if it was in the context of a small medical practice or we were in a small regional or remote area, I might suggest that Sophie does the handover to me with Jason, so there's a continuity of care. So. I mean, if Jason doesn't know me already, you know, Sophie actually introduces me and um, there's a three-way conversation for all. So Sophie's allowed to complete that part of her treatment. Yeah. Um, and obviously that's done in a very warm way and that sort of... So Jason understands why it goes from person A to person B because there's so many times where there's interrupted service and by having that transfer, that wouldn't be so interrupted. Um, but generally, I was talking to Lewis and Mary the other night and sort of said, I don't know that um, Lewis and I are the best people to talk about how a non-Indigenous person works with Indigenous people because Mary said, you know, sometimes you don't know what you don't know and I think sometimes we don't know what we know, if that makes any sense. No, it does, yeah. Um, and things that, that I take for granted, I suppose Lewis does as well, other people look at us sort of a little bit strange. So well, it's interesting, some of the questions that are coming through already are very much on the basics of creating rapport and engaging with the patient. Uh, there's a question there, can a GP shake hands with an Indigenous patient, male or female? It seems like a fairly basic question to which I don't know the answer. What, what are your thoughts? My, my warning is yes. I mean, most, depending on where you are in Australia, I've found very regional differences. But um, most Aboriginal men will shake hands with a professional, but it's also accompanied by a, a looking away. And in non-Indigenous society, you may see that as disrespect, but in Indigenous society, it's not. It's just, it's I'm going to um, meet my obligation to you as a medical professional, and this is the way I do it. So don't read too much into the handshake. Sure. And then another fairly straightforward question that I think, or it's probably not straightforward, but anybody could answer this, I suppose, is the question that's been asked about the terminology then, even the term we're using uh, Indigenous. Um, I know some people say it's better to use the word Aboriginal or First Nations people. There are different shades of meaning of all those things. Are we overthinking or is this really again about respect? I personally don't like Indigenous. Um, and I will always go with the Aboriginal and to or to Torres Strait Islander, or, or both, depending on what I know. And I can't, you can always ask that question. Um, but that's my personal preference. Other people will be fine with something else.
like I, I have clients who want to be called Murray and not Aboriginal. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Well, it's certainly specific, isn't it? Acknowledging somebody's heritage rather than just a, a grab all term. Uh, what about you, Lois? What are your thoughts on that? Well, look, uh, when I, um, uh, particularly with, with uh, uh, juniors and medical students, um, and I'm teaching about the usage of the term, if they want to talk about a group of people, then I think you can have a group of Indigenous people. Um, but when it comes to individuals, um, I think you just want to be a little bit specific um, um, and it'll take a little while to figure it out for your own area. Um, here in North Queensland, uh, uh, for most of us, you know, you uh, universally use the term Murray um, um, to describe Aboriginal um, and all Torres Strait Islander people. Um, uh, if, if, I mean, I think if somebody had ever asked my mother if she was Indigenous, that would have been a, uh, an interesting and slightly unpleasant interaction to have had. Um, um, uh, she would have uh, then explained to you the distinctions of the, uh, of the, of the groups within that. Um, but, but again, it's a, it's a, I mean, this is part of what Mary was saying also. You know, if you're going to go to an area, just find out a little bit of something about it, you know. Um, uh, and if there's uh, Indigenous health workers or liaison officers around, you can ask them that question. They'll be used to answering that question and say, so the local mob here, what do they usually refer to themselves as? Do they, you know, do they... They call themselves Murray, do they call themselves Aboriginal, do they call, you know, what is it that they call themselves? And I'm sure that that person will be able to give you a fairly quick rundown. And if there's a very complicated local history, I'm sure they can give you a rundown on that as well. Great. So it really sounds like treating everybody as an individual again, not exactly yeah. a world-shattering insight for us tonight, but really important that we acknowledge that's what it's all about. There's something that's possibly more sensitive, which has come through in the questions again, which is the the issue of um, transgenerational trauma and the trauma that people might bring into the room with them and how that would obviously uh, contribute to the way they present. Somebody's uh, asked the question about um, what's perceived as an aggressive stance, which is maybe driven by anger resulting from trauma and uh, you know whether we need to acknowledge that as a part of the person's presentation. If anybody wants to answer that or, or comment on, well, look, on I mean, the issue of trauma, I, I, I would think. I mean, if somebody comes in and they're upset, you're going you're going to try and de-escalate that, but that doesn't change an awful lot between the, the particular person. And you know, again, it's just going to be about you know showing some some decency and humanity and empathy, um, and and try and understand what's going on. And you know, you can simply you can say to any patient. Look, I'm sorry, have I, you know, have I upset you? I'm, I'm not sure if I've missed something here. Um, I'm not, honestly, I'm just trying to help. But if you could give me a bit of an idea as to what it is that you need from me right now, you know, then, then I, I'm, you know, I'm happy to give it a go. Um, uh, I, I think the, um, when I was a, a, a young practitioner, there were lots of um, clever people around telling us that the importance of main, maintaining a professional distance. Um, and, and I'm not sure that the professional distance needs to be quite as profound um, as, it was, uh, as it was explained to me at the time. And I don't think it hurts to, um, uh, to actually show a little bit of, uh, a little bit of mutual vulnerability um, um, and let them know that you don't pretend that you're an expert and that you don't pretend that you know everything. Um, and, uh, and hey, look, if, if I'm barking up the wrong tree, just give me a bit of a hint as to where we should go. And I think, that... and, and I think often you'll break through that. That issue of vulnerability is a really interesting one, Lewis, the mutual vulnerability. And Mary, you've uh, shown some vulnerability, I guess, tonight by presenting us with a case which describes some of your own experiences. I'm also taken by the concept of mentoring. Now, it sounds like you were mentored in um, learning how best to make your services uh, accessible to um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. Yeah, look, I was just thinking before, Actually, a lot of the, um, you know, the, the most um, real local learning is actually from, from my patients. So, um, but as Lewis said, just saying, look, what is it that you, what, how can I help you? What, what, I mean, I would say, what, what do you want me to call you? How do you guys refer to yourself? Um, if I've been working somewhere for a while, I might know that. And so, I mean, like, 
it might shock people, but there are some Indigenous clients where I can talk about white fellas and black fellas, and that's completely appropriate and comfortable for them. How um, do you negotiate that? That's a very sensitive approach. You must negotiate that relationship, I guess. Look, I, I, to, to be honest, I think some of it's just just uh, just having been working somewhere for a while and um, and knowing individual people. So just like you get to know any individual client, if you see them over time, you get it. You come to to understand how they talk and how they think and. Um, I, I, I guess I do probably think it's valuable to reveal a bit more of myself and maybe, look, I think working with Indigenous clients has actually taught me a lot about working with everybody. Mm. So I, I'm quite likely, like specifically at the moment, I've just moved down from North Queensland and so a lot of the patients I see, I'll say, hello, I'm Mary, I'm a psychiatry trainee, I used to be a GP, which means I'm a doctor, I work in mental health and I just moved down from North Queensland I don't know anything about the Gold Coast, so I might need you to help me. So if you say you live in Mudgery Bar, where's that? What's yep. that like? What was your high school like? Like I, I just have curiosity. I think curiosity is really valuable in any, um, any consultation, and particularly when you when you want it to be a therapeutic relationship. And I, I did have a thought when someone was talking about angry patients, and Lewis is, you know. Um, Lewis intuitively does what I've had to learn, I think. And um, one of the things I've learned to think about is a sense of safety. So if, if a person in front of me is like angry and shouting and freaked out, my, I don't think they're feeling very safe and I often mm. am not either. So I'm then thinking about what do we need to do for us both to feel safe. And I, I, I thought of one incident and the inpatient mental health unit recently where there was an Aboriginal man who was really distressed and I was called to come and help sort it out. And um, it, he, there was this, this poor man standing in the middle of, of a room with all this security standing around the outside and no one was talking to him and no one was near him. And I, I basically went up to him and said, mate, you look really stressed out. Do you want to sit down and have a yarn? And he said, yes. Yeah. And it, it, it wasn't complicated by that. What do we need for us both to feel safe? I don't That's know really that important. I mean, that whole concept about being curious and actually interpreting anger and what it means, being curious about what's behind it, not sort of thinking, how dare you be angry in my clinic, but I'm really wondering what is this is communicating uh, and responding more positively to it rather than just uh, reacting to it would seem to be a way to go. It sort of leads to another question we've been asked in a rather vague way, but I'm not sure who wants to answer this one, but a few people have actually said that um, their conscience is sometimes feeling a little bit helpless and overwhelmed in the face of the social determinants of health and the impact on, um, on health for communities. I must say, as a GP, I feel a degree of um, envy about the I don't know, cardiac surgeons who replace a mitral valve and uh, people get better. I think working with mental health, you don't always get the, the great wins that you might get in the procedural specialties. What's the panel's thoughts about the reported high turnover rates in um, uh, clinicians working with um, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander patients? Is that, is that an issue or is it to do with our or the practitioner's need for big wins all the time? I'm not sure. Uh, I, I, think, I, think you're, I think that's about right. Um, uh, but equally, there's, I think we need to better appreciate what wins we do get. So even the, the little case study that we had at the beginning, um, that, that the first thing for Sophie to realise is, no, no, kid, you've already had a win. You know, don't... We don't need to be sad about this. We don't need to be anxious about this. Celebrate the fact that you've already had a win, um, uh, and and you know feel a bit positive. And when you look at any big picture, any big picture can look massive, and and you know the the problems can be appear to be insurmountable. And you deal with that by you less okay. These half dozen things are not fixable to me today. You know, these other half dozen things may not be fixable for the next year um, for me to be involved in. So let's just narrow down on what things that I can I make a difference about here, now, today, um, between now and the next time that I see you, and just just cut it down to the incremental steps. Um, 
Um, and it's like, I think that's with any part of healthcare. You know, if you've got a patient who comes in um, who's hypertensive and you're going to start talking about some exercise and dietary changes, you don't get them to do everything today, everything at once. You get them to do, here, do this little incremental step. Get this thing and win this. Then when we've won that battle, let's go on to battle number two, then battle number three, and battle number four. Um, if you try and battle everything all at the same time, you're bound to lose and you'll be dispirited. So, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it is a thing of counting your blessings. Um, there was a thing I went to recently and they were talking to us about mindfulness. Um, and one of the really interesting things that I thought with uh, what this young psychologist was speaking about with mindfulness is that this is exactly what the, what the, um, the ancient religious traditions um, have, have all taught. And, you know, Christianity, um, uh, Islam, Judaism, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, and the thing about mindfulness, that thing about just being aware and being thankful and saying thanks for things. Um, and, and I think it's very easy for us to, um, uh, to be overcome by the storm around us um, um, and, and, not, and forget to be thankful for this one wonderful little thing that's in front of us. You know, the fact that we've got a smile from the patient now, somebody who was clearly upset and, and, um, and you know, very out of sorts when they came in and that we managed to get a smile and you know that's good and that's a win and be happy about that so that's and, a win know, and yeah yeah there's also a question being asked about uh, whether we should read communication into people turning up late or maybe not turning up and um, whether that is uh, something we should be frustrated about or whether again we can be curious if this is somebody's way of checking us out before engaging are there any thoughts on that um, Jeff, that must be difficult in your profession with long appointments. If somebody doesn't come, then uh, you're twiddling your thumbs. Oh, look, I, I quite enjoy twiddling my thumbs. Um, <laughs> for me, my, my client group is 85%, 90% uh, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander and... Um, if you look at it as far as income bracket goes, probably at the lowest that we're going to see. So that it's the nature of the beast that I expect unreliability. So I don't get frustrated when someone doesn't turn up. And I know that if I am working with someone and we, we approach something sensitive, I expect that we may see a, a no-show the next um, appointment because they've come close to something and they may have scared themselves. So I'll, I'll usually leave them a few days after the, the missed appointment and say, hey, I missed you the other day, and I'll come back. Um, so the unreliability of my client group, I expect, so I don't get upset. Okay. And, and I suppose the also I supervise other psychologists and I try to, to say to the other psychologists, this is not about you. This is about living in a world where sometimes things are really difficult and une the unexpected usually comes up. And slowly they learn. Thanks. And so obviously also working in smaller communities and everybody's in a smaller community, I guess, in some ways. Uh, what about when we encounter um, clients in the street? Uh, would you follow up with a client who didn't turn up if you bumped into them in the street? Or do you have a strategy that you use for trying to connect with somebody outside of the consulting room? I'm, I'm quite lucky um, because my clients will usually come to me in the street. Um, and those that don't, I don't acknowledge because they're not coming to me for a reason and I'll follow up, you know, maybe later that day. Um, I'll never um, approach them if they don't come to me. But Cairns is a small place. Mm. So. It's interesting. I did have that experience myself in the very small country town of Geelong where an elderly lady approached me in the supermarket and looked me in the eye and said he died, you know, and walked away. I still, 20 years later, got no idea who, her, who she was talking about, but it was a very awkward situation. What about you, Mary or, or Lewis? Are there any particular strategies that you use for um, connecting with clients who you might encounter in the street? Or is that something that's an issue? In Atherton it must be, in, even in the Gold Coast or in the Cape York. Sorry, go ahead. No, I, just, I was sort of thinking about the question about people who don't come and... Yes. Um, 
I actually, and it came up earlier for me as well, I actually have Maslow's hierarchy of needs on my wall, which I know is 1950s sociology, but it's really helpful. And so if I keep, and the question was about transgenerational trauma before. So when I think about what people are dealing with on a daily basis and what they've survived, then it, it, it helps me to realise they're doing their best. Now, it's still okay for me to have boundaries to keep myself okay, but when I can understand that they're doing their best in a really difficult circumstance, that helps me to kind of cope with it. And, and look, many of the people on our, on our webinars are, are using Medicare and it's their income, and so if the patient doesn't come, they don't get paid. So I think we also have to be pragmatic and maybe you, you, you can only do this work two days a week or something like that. But, but I think it's, for me it's just keeping that perspective of what are people's lives actually like. And, and I, I never think people are not coming just to annoy me. There's usually some complex reason I might not know. But I sure. to Lewis. <laughs> Thoughts from you, Lewis? Um, oh, so look, with, with regard to um, you know the, the folks downtown, um, the, I think it's important to you know give a smile and a head nod or, or, or a lip point um, um, to uh, to acknowledge their, their presence. If they want to talk to you about something to do with the, the recent consultation, which did or didn't happen or should have happened, they'll, they'll bring it up. Um, uh, if they don't, just acknowledge them as a, as a fellow traveller in life. Um, <coughs> and somebody else who shares the community with you. Um, and I think, look, in Atherton, I, um, I don't think it's possible for me to walk down the street with, without seeing folks who are patients of mine. Um, uh, you know, and, and if somebody isn't a patient of mine, then they're probably two degrees of separation. I've looked after their brother, sister, mother, father, son, daughter, you know. So you just, you just assume that everybody knows who you are anyway. And, um, and, you know, if, if, if people want to talk, just let them have that permission to talk. Um, um, people are fa I find people fairly respectful. They won't invade my privacy very much. Or, you know, I know some people get worried about that. I, I haven't actually found that myself. Um, uh, and I think at the end of the day, I like the community that I live in. I like the people who come and see me. So I don't know if they have a chat to me down the street, but I don't find it particularly offensive or rude. I, Quite nice. Sure. So well, that sounds great. Well, the questions come in, which I'm finding really interesting. Here at the university, we're trying very hard to move away from, I guess, a deficit model of, in, of um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health that we're teaching the students to look more at um, First Nations knowledges or whatever we would call it. The question has been asked about whether um, traditional belief systems can play a role in the care of uh, people who are under stress and whether we're doing enough to actually engage with people's traditional belief systems in treating their mental health. Is that something we, we should be considering? Yes. Yes, uh, okay. Yes. <laughs> there numbers, be, be numbers of services around the place um, who, who do already have established relationships um, with, uh, with various traditional healers um, um, around the place. Um, and, and by all means, it's, it's if, if, your, if your patient, if your client um, looks like they're, they're wanting to utilise those services, then you can always encourage that. Remember, I mean, with a lot of people, who, a lot of Aboriginal people who would use those services, they may well have already been to... Um, uh, to, a, to you know a, a traditional healer before they come to you in the first place, um, and, and I suppose the importance is, is really in, in not dismissing what it is um, that uh, that somebody else who is ultimately a healthcare worker, um, what it is that they do. You know, I, I may not understand all the workings of the of the Nunkery in there in Central Australia, but I know better than to disrespect it. Um, equally, with non-Indigenous clientele. If they come in and they're going to, to alternative therapies, um, um, I, I, I try to be very careful to not to not be disparaging and to and to encourage them. To know that if this if this works for you, then that's fantastic. Because I think if they if they knew what most of us knew about medicine and how much of it is as much witchcraft as it is as art um, um, and science, then um, then then I suppose we might we might see that we all have a place. Um, you know, and some things we'll understand better than others. 
Great. And another question has been asked, which is also very important, by somebody who worked for many years as a mental health nurse in remote Northern Territory. And uh, we have discussed as a group previously the issues of remote area nurses being called upon to provide mental health care in remote areas, often with little support. But uh, Trevor's made the point that um, building trust is obviously so important. Um, how do we go about building trust with a, uh, a, a client who may be an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander? I know we've, we've touched on some of this, but what about in small communities particularly? Um, maybe even where mental health can have a negative connotation or a stigma. I know in some communities that's very much the case. I know it is in the medical community mental health is seen as something that we should be ashamed of for having problems with it. What is the panel's thoughts on how we go about building trust, in, particularly in small communities with people who need our service? I, I mean, I'll just throw in, you must be consistent, you must be respectful, because if someone is vigilant to um, practitioners being inauthentic, you need to be that same person every day. <clears throat> and that goes back to what Lewis's comment is about, you know, when you're approached by someone in the street, if you're warm with them in the clinic, it doesn't make sense to be cold to them in the street. And remember that in a smaller community, when you deal with one person, you deal with the whole family. So yeah. if you're working across families and you're telling different family members different stories, well then that's gonna come back and bite you. Great. Any, any thoughts from you, Mary, on that? Yeah, I think being, being authentic is really important. Look, I, I also, as a, on a practical level, I, I did find it really helpful putting up the map of, of the Indigenous country um, up on my wall at Headspace, and then, when, then I could ask um, clients if they wanted to show me where, they, where their people were from. Um, and I have found it helpful if someone is from somewhere that I've actually been to talk about you know, that that I have some comprehension of what they're talking about, where they're from. Um, that's that's perhaps about helping people with sense of safety as well, but also finding things that we have in common rather than focusing on difference. Um, what was the most recent question you asked me, Steve? It's going so fast, my thinking can't keep up. There's certainly plenty going on, but I guess it was about establishing um, rapport or trust uh, with a with a client, and maybe maybe the the youth mental health area is a good place to consider. I mean, uh, young people are generally suspicious of healthcare providers. I think most of the time. Um, I, what... uh, yeah, that that made me think. The other thing is understanding that I I've got, you know, if I'm working under Medicare, I'm expected to work in the Western medic, medical paradigm, yeah. but that isn't the only way of understanding the world. So when I have respect for the way that the person who's coming to see me might understand things, and then we're sharing knowledge, I think that helps to build trust. Whereas if I come in with the view that I know what's wrong with you and how to fix it, I don't think that that's very helpful. You've led us into a question then, which I'm absolutely terrified to ask, because it is such a massive and such a fundamental question. And brace yourselves, people. How do Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians conceptualise mental health or wellbeing? Over to you. Oh, I, I, I think it's, well, I, supp I suppose the, um, um, almost the, that question itself, I mean, it's a very, it's a fine question, but it's almost a little deficit in itself, in this, it's, um, whereas I suppose it's about what is health, and health is actually about feeling good and being good and being happy um, um, and being vital, um, uh, and I suppose I, I, I just I would just turn it around the other way. Um, that anything that makes you um, not feeling well, not feeling happy, you know, something is causing pain, and whether that pain is physical, emotional, spiritual, it's all it's all pain, and it's all going to you know make your life less happy than it could be. Um, so I, I think the the uh, I, I think for 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 most, uh, most Indigenous people, there is just a, 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 a whole of life view. Um, and in fairness, I think that's not particularly different of, of you know, a lot of other human beings. I think most Australians um, are trying to seek an overall happiness, but there is, there is this, this, what I observe um, among non-Indigenous Australians as, 
as a cultural thing of, of this artificial separation of the different forms of health. Um, um, I, I find it really quite interesting um, that people artificially separate um, being, being um, emotionally happy from being um, physically well from being um, uh, uh, spiritually satiated. That, well, I, know, I think they're all, part, all, 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 all bits of exactly the same thing. Um, and it's, a, it's an interesting Western paradigm. Um, uh, and I think it's a recent Western paradigm too, by the way, um, um, that's really only since about the Second World War, where we have this separation of these, of these things into um, different compartments of our humanity. And I'm, I'm not sure that that's an overly useful way to look at it. I, I think it's more as, you know, that looking at the whole person. And I think my experiences among patients is they seem to appreciate the idea of you looking them at, at, at them as a whole person and not just as a, oh, you're a heart that's got some trouble or you're a lung that's not working. You know, that there's a whole human being attached to that as well. And if we can make that person feel a bit better about a few other things, it might decrease the stress on the heart or the lung. Okay. And Lewis, can, can I add that I also think saying you're a major depressive disorder or you're a schizophrenic, or, you know, <laughs> e equally, I don't think that's helpful. What, Steve, would it be okay if I put those slides in now? Because I think they really answer that question. Yeah, I think um, that's a great idea, Mary. We'll go so, to those now. So I don't know whether the audience is aware, but there is a, a manual um, for, it's called Working Together, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Mental Health and Wellbeing Principles and Practice, um, which I found really helpful. So Lewis and Jeff, well, in fact, Jeff contributed to this manual, but Lewis and Jeff kind of didn't need to know this stuff articulated in a theoretical way because they just know it. But I did, and I found this really helpful, so I thought I would just um, just quickly go over those. So, so Lewis has already talked about that holistic view of everything, and, it actually, and you know, it's in, including land as well. Self-determination is, is really, really important in healthcare provision. Culturally valid understandings must shape the provision of service. So we have to actually ask communities how they want care provided to them, what it is we can bring that could be helpful. Um, understanding the history of trauma, dispossession, loss. Um, human rights have to be part of healthcare. Understanding that racism, stigma, environmental degradation, social disadvantage continue and continue to contribute to people's, you know, stress. Um, family and kinship is central. Something that has really helped me to, to also remember, because I, like I, I try not to, but I'm sure I make assumptions all the time, but realising, like Lewis was saying with Headspace, that there isn't hetero, there isn't um, homogeneity. Like there's lots and lots of different Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and current experiences and so that that curiosity about the person with you and just thinking about what is the most what can i do for the person with me here right now rather than being overwhelmed by the the big thing and then as as everybody has said recognizing that there's strengths creativity endurance and a deep understanding of the relationship between human beings in their environment and myself it might sound a bit weird but I, I have come to be really grateful that this kind of model of health and well-being rather than, um, you know, an, an illness-based model is, is actually carried for everybody by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who have insisted that we keep that way of thinking and we must think about their health and well-being in that way. And I think it's good for all of us. And I guess I also think... Um, we, we permit them to carry the sacred. So we, we have a very secular culture and it's almost a bit awkward to talk about, you know, spirit or soul. Um, but, but I think, you know, uh, certainly a, a lot of very soulful things I have learned from Lewis. And every time, every time I have a conversation with Lewis, I kind of feel, you know, he gave me permission to um, value the mentorship of the old white men who taught me medicine. That was all a bit awkward, but Lewis was like, you know, these have been really wise mentors for him. And I thought, you know, they have been for me too, and it's okay to say that. And I, I just think being able to recognize the, the sacred and the soulful 
is okay. Well, as the token old white man on the panel, I'll um, <laughs> advance to the next slide. Um, the question has been asked whether these, um, these, these nine principles will be available, and uh, they will be. Um, you can see a link uh, down the bottom there. But, uh, so sorry, Mary, did you want to talk any further about the principles? No, no, I think I was meant to advance the slides. And I was reading them on a different piece of paper. So sure. they're there now, and there's a photograph of that manual. It's available as a PDF online for free, and I believe you can still ring up the Telethon Institute and order a copy. Great. Jeff All may right. have something to add on that because he has been involved with it. So, Jeff, you, you were a contributor to it. Is there anything further you wanted to add to what Mary's told us about that resource? It looks very useful. Uh, well, I, I see it on, on lots of bookshelves, which is positive. Um, I will honestly put my hand up and say I haven't read every chapter in the book. Um, but really, it's what you take out of it and how you apply it that's more important. So you can read and read and read and read, but be informed by your clients, not by a book. I think that's very important as well. Okay, thanks for that. There, uh, there's still a chance to ask questions um, before we finish at uh, half past the hour in Eastern States. Um, there's a few more that have come in while we've been looking at that resource. There's been a question about um, developing cultural literacy um, and the question's asked for non-ATSI workers as a way to develop cultural literacy. What's the best way to go about that? Um, I'm not sure whether any panel members have any thoughts on that topic and uh, whether that also applies to um, health workers who are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders themselves. I think it just comes from, from a conversation. If, if you're learning a new language, um, um, you can learn all the, all the important parts of that, um, that language, but nothing builds it up. You know, so if I'm going to learn Italian, then, then it's all very good. You know, I can do the online course and get all the video tapes and the audio tapes and that's all useful, but nothing's quite as good as actually finding a, um, somebody around who is fluent in Italian and just sitting in and speaking with them. And I think, I think the same is, it w would be true in this case, um, that the, the thing that's going to make the, the most amount of difference um, is in relationship. Um, finding, finding that um, Indigenous person around um, who you can actually strike up a friendship with and have a conversation um, and you know it'll take time, and you you know it'll, it'll take time to build that trust up. But as you do, you'll just learn more, and you'll understand more, and you become more fluent in the um, in the concepts. You know, my my very best friend in the world is is an Africana, um, and it's the um, um, and look, this is my go-to guy. If I if I was stressed about anything whatsoever, um, my brother Chuck Grobler is the first guy I get on the phone to. Um, to help me deal with whatever stressors I'm facing. And if you uh, tell the 21-year-old uh, me that when you get to be 50 years of age, your best mate on the planet is going to be um, a white South African, um, uh, I'd have laughed at you. I thought that that would have been just culturally impossible. And what, yet, quality, what quality has he got, Lewis, that you see in him that makes him such a good friend? He is just one of the most decent, wonderful, loving human beings I've come across in my life. He's, he's just, you know, incredibly honest and, and incredibly empathetic. Um, and and I know that if any time I ask my brother for help, he will do anything that he possibly can. But it's just, it's a it's a human relationship, you know, that I identify with this guy as just he's a he's a fellow traveller in life. Um, um, and we have uh, it was interesting. One day we were talking about some things, and he said, "Oh, Lewis, I, you know, I've got to, I, I just have to admit." I, I don't actually think of you as being black. And I said, that's okay, brother, I don't really think of you as being white. Um, and, and so I think, you, I, I think very quickly you can move past those, um, past those things um, uh, and just and increase that cultural literacy that you have with somebody by just the actual practice of, um, of that relationship. Um, uh, I think also just the other thing too, with, with, particularly with, with Aboriginal people, we're an adoptive people, um, uh, and um, uh, the, when we when we get into know each other, if we're in a large group of, of you know of Murrays, then the first thing we'll start doing is genealogies and find out who belongs to who and, and who's related to who. Um, 
and, and once there, a, a relationship is established, then that actually cuts through an awful lot of things. And the other interesting thing with, with, um, with um, you know, Aboriginal people, certainly Torres Strait Islander people have come across to the same thing, that there's these interesting um, uh, ways that, that non-Indigenous people have of describing um, family relationships. You know, they've got things like stepbrothers and stepsisters and half-brothers and half-sisters and adopter-brothers and adopter-sisters, which in Murray families, that's the thing that doesn't exist. They're either your family or they're not. And how that person got to be a member of your family, well, that's a bit of material. Whether they're your family because they share your parents, because your mother adopted them, because, you know, their dad is, is, is your dad's best mate. Yeah. All of that is just meaningless. And it only matters if they belong. Um, and, and I think that it's one of the things as, as people get, establish those relationships with, uh, with Indigenous Australians, I'll find that, uh, that you know, it's, you either belong or you don't. And, and if you belong, it doesn't matter how non-Indigenous you are, it doesn't matter how white you are, it doesn't matter you know, how much you think that you come from the opposite. Um, if you, once you're accepted, you're accepted. I don't think it's very complicated. Sorry. No, absolutely. And actually, there's a very simple question being asked as well, which again is quite complex. And I know in the medical school, we're very conscious of our Indigenous academics potentially being burnt out by being asked the same questions again and again. The question has been asked, how do Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health workers cope with? Do they get sick of being asked the same questions again and again about what terminology to use, whether to shake hands, whether to make eye contact, and all the questions we've asked of... Uh, Lewis and Jeff tonight. Um, how do you approach that on a day-to-day -day basis when the new trainee asks exactly the same questions as the last one? Who do you want to answer that? Yeah. Or anybody that wants to, are you going to jump in and give your perspective, Mary? Oh. That'd be good. Well, I was, all I was going to say is that if they do get sick of it, they're probably going to laugh about me later, and that's fine. I. I think with humour, but there, but people are so gracious. This is this is something we've talked about. Like if if your intention, if you're clearly authentic and you're clearly wanting to help and you're you're honestly asking a question, people are gracious. Do you get ticked off, Jeff? <laughs> I mean, you're both very gracious people, but is this something that does uh, does get to you after a while? Uh, Jeff's phone's dropped out, so... Ah. Well, I'll, 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 I'll take it then, Steve. Um, I suppose it's the... Um, sorry, this will a, a slightly odd, odd, um, odd, odd segue, if you'll humour me. Um, uh, um, Park, Michael Parkinson was talking about um, having interviewed a former um, uh, England cricket captain um, and, uh, and was asking him about um, the stress of facing a fast bowler. Um, and this guy who was a, who was a veteran of, of the Battle of Britain um, said, look, having a Messerschmitt 109 up your ass, that's stress facing a fast bowler, that's just a game. I think, I think in, in, in a sense, the, um, uh, of all the stressors we face, you know, when I went to school, the stressors were, you know, trying to make sure that the teacher didn't notice me because if they did, that was going to be bad for me, trying to not get myself beaten up in the schoolyard yet again for, you know, walking more black. Um, trying not to attract the attention of a policeman um, and get taken away from my parents. So if the biggest stressor I've got to face today is, is having to explain to two different people a few simple things about Murray, it's like, that's, well, that's not even stress, you know. It might get tedious, but it's certainly not stressful. OK, well, thanks for putting that in perspective, of us. That's absolutely brilliant. Um, we've had another couple of very practical questions about, um, and I don't think Jeff's back with us yet to ask specifically about psychological interventions. But can maybe then, in, um, Steve, or? Oh, you're there, Jeff. Great, fantastic. Somebody's asked the question about whether there are any particular approaches you might use in working with an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, client specifically, like, you know, narrative therapy in preference to something else. Can you give us any thoughts on that? Well, it might be a product of my age, but I'm very much um, finding that you apply the existential principles and most Aboriginal men more generally will, will run with that the whole idea around responsibility and freedom and choice. Um, and also sort of put it back so that you actually have your client doing the work outside of the therapy room and not inside the therapy room. Okay. 
Great. What about you, Mary? What about in your work in um, psychiatry? Is there any? I mean, people have been asking questions about whether we overuse medications, particularly in general practice. Uh, are there any other approaches you think we should be using straight up? Obviously, there are. Um, well, we go back to that that idea of of people's understanding of health as being holistic. So I'm always thinking, you know, what I ask people. I mean. I don't think people experience it as rude, but you know, who lives at your place? What's what's your accommodation like? Do you feel safe there? Is it secure? How are you financially okay? Do you have enough meaningful things to do? How are your relationships? What's your nutrition like? How's your sleep? Do you get outside? Do you get in touch with nature? Um, yes, we do overuse medications in Australia. We are the third highest prescribers of antidepressants in the OCD. OECD, not counting America. So I think there's um, Norway, then Canada, then Australia. Um, but that's not just in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. That's that's in everybody. So I think um, I I again I said to already I have Maslow's on the wall. So I probably do a lot of advocacy and sometimes filling out forms. Um, but a, a lot of education for people around. You know, we can call this a mental health symptom. We can also call it an understandable response to things that have happened. And and we can help you feel safer in your world, but first of all, we have to make sure you actually have a safe world. So that, that's kind of my approach. Great. Thanks for that. Um, does, um, we're getting to the time now where we need to be wrapping up. I just wonder if each of the panellists would be able to give us their closing thoughts on what's been discussed tonight, the take-home messages. Maybe if we start with you, Lewis. Oh, okay. I think for me the take-home message is, is as simple as um, you're just sitting across, you know, you're sitting across the table from another human being um, uh, that, that there's not really very much difference between, um, um, you know, one human being and the next when it comes to their, um, uh, their, their needs, you know, as Mary keeps talking about the most, most of those hierarchy, um, and and just show you know show a little bit of thought, time, compassion, a bit of empathy, um, uh, and just just point about that authenticity, how important it is um, um, to be able to be yourself um, uh, and and be reliably that same person over and over again, um, so that you don't come across as being a fraud and you don't lose people's trust. Um, but people are pretty forgiving, and most of the time when they turn up to us, they're actually after help. That's why they turned up in the first place. And if you can just give them some sense that you're, in, that you're, that you're trying your best to offer it, they'll probably, you know, they'll be with you for a bit. They'll give you a go. Okay, great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, what about you, Mary? I think you're next up. What are your closing thoughts? And I must say, the resource you've put up is uh, getting a lot of love from the group. Uh, it sounds like people are going to want the link to that, so we'll make sure that's uh, clearly available. Was but that what are the, your... the slides? Was that, Steve? Yes, yeah. I, I've actually also put some other resources in, which was a bit late, so they'll be in after the, um, the webinar. But there's a, the Menzies School of Health Research has got a number of excellent resources for working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander clients. Um, Black Dog Institute has got a list of all the online um, resources and there is also a um, six hour introduction to narrative practice for free from the Dulwich Centre in South Australia. Um, so those will all be in the, the resource box in, when it's posted online. But I guess um, somebody asked about um, cultural literacy. I do really love black comedy on ABC yes. and if you watch the <laughs> rerun, I think, I'm serious. Like it's really, really fun but it's actually really, really accurate. So I, I, I think I'm just going to leave that as my tip. Okay, well, there's a, a must-watch for iView there from Mary and Elias. Thank you very much for that. Uh, what about you, Jeff? What are your uh, closing thoughts from this evening? Oh, probably just a challenge to um, those who are working in the sort of psychology clinical space, and that is it's all too often that we see you walk into a psychologist's room and you'll see chairs laid out nicely and you'll see a nice little coffee table with some probably very uninteresting books sort of scattered on the table. Take the table away and, and then try to work out who's actually uncomfortable. Because nine times out of 10, it's the therapist and not the client. 
yeah. if you're feeling uncomfortable, maybe you're not doing something right. So learn actually how to work with your client without the barrier. Fabulous. And when you remove the table, leave the table outside the room, never bring it back, it gets easier. Okay, so table-free consulting sounds excellent. And actually, you've um, you've hit the mark twice tonight with uh, a couple of things that the uh, the chat's been picking up on. Um, one of them is that it's not about you. It's not about the therapist. That comment you made earlier, that uh, the focus is on the client. But the other thing you said is it is about you. It's about being authentic. So it looks like that's been a real takeaway for people who are on the discussion tonight. And the other thing that's come through quite strongly was this concept of being curious and being curious about the person who's sitting opposite you and what their background is, or maybe even sitting beside you, you never know. Uh, maybe we've got time for one last question, which has just come up, which I have to resist, which is about, can't resist, it's about learning about the community you're in. Now, Mary, I gather you moved to Cape York. What, how much time did you invest in finding out about the community that you'd arrived in? Look, I, I didn't move there, Steve. I was uh, fly in, fly out. But what yeah. I did was, um, so each each of the communities on the Cape has a council. So I went to the council website and I just read everything I could before I went. And I also am just a curious person. So if there's a plaque, I'll go read the plaque. If there's a display board somewhere, I'll go and read it. So I think just just going in with an open mind and, and being observant and asking questions. And people people like being, they like sharing their place with you and you having a genuine interest in it and I I, I know we've already said our last thing but I, I did want to say like 20 years down the track I can honestly say that my work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander clients has totally enriched my life and I feel like I've got much more out of it than, than I've um, probably contributed so just stick with it uh, be, be, be yourself and, um, and it's really such a worthwhile thing to do and if you can't do it five days a week that's okay just do what you can <laughs> sure and the important thing you said then amongst other important things was being genuinely curious and having that sincerity um, that it really is tapping into ourselves as as humans rather than just a professional coat that we put on when we're working so I think that's a really important point as well Okay, so we'll, it's probably time to wrap up now unless there's any final comments from the panel before we run through the, the shutdown script. If not, I'd like to thank you all very much, all three of you. I think you've given us an awful lot to think about and it's just been fabulous from my point of view. I think I've, I've learned an enormous amount. Um, there's also the opportunity for people who have uh, um, watched us tonight to access the resources that Mary's referred to. There's a light blue icon at the top right of the screen. It might be a little moment before all the resources uh, are uploaded, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to access the resources that are there. There is an exit survey that we would encourage people to complete, uh, and that's the yellow icon at the top of the screen on your on your version. Um, so please fill that out. It's really helpful for us helpful for us to know whether tonight's webinar has helped us meet those learning objectives, which you'll recall from the beginning of the session. There are other mental health professional network webinars coming up. There's better outcomes for people with schizophrenia taking a patient-centered approach on the 7th of November. There's also collaborating, which is obviously the key for the mental health professional network, uh, to recognize and address conduct disorder on the 3rd of December. Um, there'll be email communications about some partner webinars coming up. Uh, looking at emerging minds and working to support children and families living with uh, fecal, uh, sorry, fetal, fecal, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. That's uh, the 26th of September, not that far away. Um, as well as one with the GPMHC, uh, well, exploring collaborative care on suicide prevention and bereavement, which is on Monday, the 28th of October. Um, as well as uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs on treating post-traumatic stress disorder in veterans on Tuesday 29th of October. So who's ever going to need free-to-air TV again? Um, a quick comment that the Mental Health Professional Network does support the engagement and ongoing maintenance of practitioner networks. 
uh, where clinicians from different disciplines meet regularly with other mental health practitioners and we share tips, resources, build local referral pathways, pathways in your area as well as engaging in CPD activities like this. So to learn more about joining your local practitioner network and maybe watching a webinar in company, uh, please contact MHPN or go to the news section of the website. Uh, and also you can interest, uh, register your interest in the exit survey that hopefully everybody is filling out. So before I close, this is a really important point, um, I would like to acknowledge the lived experience of people and carers who have uh, lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to do so. So thank you to everyone tonight, to Lewis and Jeff and Mary uh, and all of you online for your participation this evening and I hope you enjoy the rest of tonight. Thanks very much indeed.